Takes hey, happy Friday. I'm thrilled to be here today with Michael Craven. We are going to be discussing gray divorce. What is the graying of divorce? What is happening? And I'm so excited to talk about this, Michael. So tell us what it is. What's going on with these people? Thanks, Betsy. First, I really appreciate being here. Um, it's an honor. I'm grateful for the opportunity. Uh, divorce and gray divorce is a substantial part of my practice, so I like talking about it. And with all divorces, you know, having good people, uh, you know, to, to as resources is really important. And real estate is a huge part of many, many divorces. So, you know, I'm glad to be connected with you. So right into it, what is a gray divorce? Well, it's a trend, really. Um, there's no technical name, uh, technical definition for a gray divorce. Uh, so anybody could define it differently, but it, it's essentially a reference to, you know, this gray hair stuff coming in uh, later in life. <laughs> and so it references a, a certain demographic in the population, people, I'll say, 55 and older. And generally, uh, at least with respect to my practice, people who've been married a pretty long time, 25 plus years. Um, you know, and this demographic is actually a, a huge portion of the people that get divorced today. In years past, it was a small portion, but over the last decade or so, it's increased and more and more people, 55 and plus, are getting a divorce. So it, it, it's an it's an interesting um, area to be in. So it, I'm assuming um, that it makes it a little more, in some ways, more complicated, in other ways, less complicated. And I have to say that um, maybe my mom was a trendsetter because I think it was 19, I don't even remember, 1994, years ago, uh, She's gone now, but she, after 40 some odd years of divorce, of marriage, my mother and father got divorced. So while they didn't have to worry about the kids, it presented, you know, we were all grown adults. It presented other problems. So what, what kind of problems are you seeing there? Um, well, your, your mom definitely was a trendsetter. I mean, things have changed since that time, uh, you know, and I think some of the reasons for it are, Back when your mom got divorced, there was much more of a stigma attached to divorce. I don't really think there is one today. And I think also women didn't have the same opportunities to be independent back then and more reliant upon support. So, you know, nowadays the women are often the, the driver of all divorces, including gray divorces. Mm. Um, but, I, you know, I think the number one change is that people are living longer and you know, you know, everybody knows the saying 60s, the new 50 or similar types of expressions. And, you know, somebody, you know, 50 years ago when they hit 60, they're like, well, I'm going to be dead soon. Why, you know, why get divorced? But now, um, you know, people are saying I have 20, 30, maybe more years to live and I and they're healthier and they want to they want to live their life happily. Um, but you are right in some ways a gray divorce is simpler and in other ways it's it's definitely more complex i think some of the factors that um come into the gray divorce arena are both i i, I guess i would lump them in two big categories emotional and financial so i i think the emotional part of it which obviously isn't legal but as a counselor to all my clients i have to kind of help them go through this process emotionally too. But, you know, we're talking about long-term re relationships occurring at a, a very vulnerable time in people's lives. You know, they're either, you know, they're done accumulating their nest egg or they're almost done doing that. And so there's fears related to that. They've had a long-term relationship that's being separate, you know, separated, divided, dissolved. And that's not just with their spouse. It's with, um, you know, in-law families, it's with their friends that are often coupled up and you, you don't know which side everybody's going to. Um, it's with your community, your neighborhood, often, uh, you know, in your in your field, often it's people who've been tied to a home for a real long time and they don't know what's going to happen to that. So there's, um, you know, the emotional part of it 
is extremely important. And often, you know, you have two different people in a divorce. So often you have two, di- two spouses that are at different stages of that emotional spectrum. Mm-hmm. And you cannot make a lot of headway until both people sort of catch up to each other. And so that's interesting. That's really interesting. How do you, I mean, and I know every case is different and um, I'm listening to you and a lot of what I do, we, we are counselors, even though mm-hmm. we're not counselors because right. we deal with very emotional parts of people's lives. Um, so do you wait for them to catch up? Do you nudge the, how does that, how do you manage that? So you know, every case, sure. yeah, that, that, that's a great question. Every case is, is different for sure. Um, you know, but, you know, some, some cases have immediate needs for various different reasons. You know, there could be some kind of, um, you know, business problem or, arising or other things. And, and in other cases, there is time to wait. So, um, you know, where possible, it is good to give people some time to to catch up and 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 uh, to understand what's going on and to take it all in and, and be able to move forward, um, you know, in, in a pretty logical way versus an emotional way. But you know, there are limits to that. Yeah, and <laughs> yeah you got to know where that is. <laughs> right, right. So, you know, every, like I said, every case is different, but I, I think as a general rule, it is good to give people some space and time because there's a lot of things that you could do that's pro- productive for the client and for the, the case in general to, to move it forward. You just have to be uh, diplomatic about how you do it. Yeah. I guess it's one of those things you got to give time, but not too much time. Um, but, you know, and I've seen the cycles and I've told um, friends, you know, they're really nice in the beginning, then they get really angry, then they get spiked, you know, and you watch all these emotions. But, um, you know, your skill over the years is going to give you uh, a gut. I'm sorry, but you're going to know when enough is enough. <laughs> right. You know, where you yeah. can see it going off the rails. Right, which is, and, and and actually that leads into another really important issue in the gray divorce arena. You know, divorce cases can be very quick, uncontentious, um, and people can leave and move on with their lives. And others, as I'm sure all your viewers are watching, would understand that there's the or the roses cases too that take years, and everybody has spent a lot of money. And they've spent a lot of uh, emotional currency also. So um, you get to a point in a case where people just are like, I'm tired. I want to be done. I don't care. And that may not be as critical for a a 35-year-old who has the opportunity to, you know, rebuild and, and whether it's finances or family or whatever the case is. But, you know, for people at, at like my stage of life, um, you know, that's, that isn't always so easy to, to do that. And um, it, so they, sometimes people, my clients want to concede and get the case over with because it's been long, it's been expensive, it's been draining financially and emotionally, but, you know, throwing in the towel can have a really big impact because, you know, a graying divorce client may not have that opportunity like a 35 year old to not have the, the benefit of time to get themselves back. So you have clients that are willing to accept something that, you know, I suspect, I mean, I'm not a, a financial expert as far as investments go, but I have a you know, pretty strong background in that. And, you know, you don't want your client to take a deal that you know or suspect strongly that they're just not going to be able to live their life the way they think they're going to live it. So, you know, you're going to have a client two, three, five years down the road that has buyer's remorse and is going to be, you know, very bitter about their situation. 
Um, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So, but then, you, you know, I think that that's where you have to say there's a difference between trying to get every last squeeze nickel because that isn't going to matter. 100%. But to getting to a place where you can exist and live and, you know, there's somewhere in between there. And I'm sure that's right. where you try to get. Right. So a lot of um, these particular cases, I think, require building a team often and, mm. you know, making sure that your clients, you know, one, are staying healthy through the process. I mean, in every case they should do that, but I think it's particularly important, uh, you know, for people 55 and plus. So, you know, you you want to make sure your clients are, you know, are com- you know, continuing their social life and eating well, exercising well, um, and have their um, security friend network and, and family network, but also more professional network too. And, you know, in a lot of these cases, I will have my clients talk to financial planners, investment people, you know, because the practicality of, of people getting divorced later in life, long-term marriages, they've accumulated more than younger people. Um, and so you, you need more sophisticated people on your team. That's but, excellent. I love that because then you're sort of, everybody's working together. You've got your financial plan, your, your, you know, your tax. I know you're a CPA, but still right. you're an accountant, maybe a therapist, maybe, you know, sometimes they have to you bring in a realtor if you need to know the cost of the home, the assets. Um, and to, you know, from a real estate point of view to talk about, well, what is it going to cost you to go wherever you're going? You know, how do right. they know? <laughs> you know so. I mean, I would say, you know, there's maybe three or four big financial areas in the great divorce and, and real estate is that and retirement accounts are probably yeah. the, the two big ones uh, because they often represent a large portion of, of people's wealth. Um, and the houses are, are very interesting. I, I, I mean, my experience, this is only anecdotal. I don't necessarily have data on it, but prior to 2008, when I'm sure Betsy, you know what happened then, mm-hmm. um, you know, the, the real estate market just crashed. Before that, at least one of the spouses was almost always tied to their house. And they were willing to make all kinds of concessions just to keep the house. I find that that still exists, but to a lesser extent. I don't, I don't know about you, if you if you see that, but. I um, I often will counsel that that is not a good idea because right. um, many times like a, the wife, and, and I don't want this to sound sexist, but sometimes they want to keep that house and they can't afford, A, they can't afford to maintain it, and B, it's a burden. I mean, I love real estate and I love homes, but it's a commitment and work. And if you've got to start all over and readjust your life, unless you're really into gardening uh, in a big way and mowing the lawn and shoveling the snow and replacing things, my advice is always to think small. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean, as a longtime homeowner, oh my God, there's so much going on with a house. And, you know, before you know it, you know, big expenses come up. So right. you, your financial plan has to incorporate all of those contingencies. Right. And um, keeping a house, I mean, it could be fine in a lot of cases, but yeah. I think I think you really have to vet the idea. And, and seriously, you, it's not it's not a small decision. No. What, I, what I do find, though, is, you know, you're talking about severing a relationship with somebody you've been with for a long time, severing maybe family ties, and then to say, okay, you've got to cut loose on this house that you're, you know, invested in, I don't mean financially, the neighbor, the neighborhood that you love. And it, you know, it's just too much for people. Yeah. They, yeah. they, 
they can't do it all. You know, you can't yeah. have that many losses in a short period of time. Right, right, right. It, 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 selling a home, unless you're an army brat or whatever, it's very, very difficult for people. And it's very difficult even for the children of, and I've seen this a lot, um, whether it's a divorce or the parents just decide, you know, we've had enough, the children go crazy over the parents selling the home. because. Awesome. Yeah, for sure. It, it, it is just such an emotional uh, thing. So I think both of our jobs is to try and help people put that in perspective um, to, to, to let them see now is an opportunity for a new chapter. And the person who's more tied to the home, I, I would say that might even be the number one thing they tell me. I have to keep this house for the kids now. You know, certainly that's a product of how old your children are. You know, if your kids are 40 years old and live out of state, it's less of a concern. But if your kids are, you know, college or, you know, a few years after that, people definitely want to leave their homes. And I, you know, I think a lot of people when the pandemic started were grateful they had their homes for their, you know, many, many kids came back to live with their parents yeah. during the pandemic. So, yeah. Well, this is, this is, and so in parting, just the last thing, if you are, and I know this is sort of a big question, but um, if you are graying or anybody, if you're interested and you're thinking about getting divorced, I always like to leave people with a few getting your ducks in a row uh, so that you're not taken. Do you have some words of wisdom for that? Sure. I've got some suggestions. Thanks for asking. Um, you know, so, and, and, and what that time frame looks like is different for a lot of people. Um, you know, I have a lot of clients who, you know, reached out to me at one point and then I don't hear from them for a couple of years. I have others that actually hire me, pay it, pay money. It sits in a trust account and they take no action for many years. So, you know, especially at this stage of life, it, it is often a long term process just thinking about it and doing it. But, you know, if you are thinking about it and, and you know, you're not sure if it's going to happen, but it might. It's, you certainly have time to plan and um, strategize about it. So, you know, first, you should probably at least consult with an attorney so that mm -hmm. they can help you uh, fine tune this advice for your particular situation. However, you know, it's always good to retain records, um, gather up everything, you know, especially if you're the spouse who's not in possession or control or has interaction with that. So you, you should do that. It's a good idea to check your credit score and um, you can get free, not your credit score, I'm sorry, but your, your, your credit report. Um, mm -hmm. And you can get a free credit report three times a year from three different credit reporting agencies. Um, Annualcreditreport.com, I think is, is, is the web, uh, the link. And, um, you know, and if you have bad credit, you should work on fixing that. Uh, if you have good credit and you don't have credit on your, in your own name, you should start getting it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and if you have any assets that would be considered non-marital, meaning things you might've had before you got married, it might be in a different form, you know, and, you know, you sold something, bought something. Um, you could talk to your attorney about what non-marital means, but if you have those kinds of assets, you, you want to go and make sure you can get the documents that help prove that claim. You know, just remember that, you know, records aren't stored forever. So if you, right. you know, if you're thinking you might not get divorced for a few years, by then those records could not be retained by financial institutions or others. So get them and have them and keep them in a secure place, you know, internet or whatever, you know, out of, out of reach of somebody taking them and destroying them. Um, right. Because without those records, you might have an impossible um, chance of proving something that might be very significant financially to you. Right. Yeah. Possession is nine tenths of the law. I mean, this is, yeah. Yeah. And in the divorce, there's, there's, a, there's a heavy presumption that everything belongs to the marriage. So, if you want to prove otherwise, you, you, you need records. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Well, I want to thank you so much. This was so interesting and it's, it's, you know, it's eye opening that this is, and you know, our world is changing as we are living longer because I say the same thing in the real estate business. Part of why we have this home shortage is because people are living longer and staying in their homes longer. There's no reason to leave. Right. So, so these are different trends that are occurring uh, be, because of that. So I'm so glad that you were able to talk with us and help anybody out there. If you have any questions, I'm sure you can reach out to Michael. I happen to know he does an amazing job and is also very calming. And uh, thank you. So anyway, well, thank you so much and everybody have a great weekend. Thanks. Everybody have a good weekend too for me and Betsy. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.